Right. So I titled this sermon today, uh, From the Cross to the Resurrection. Subtitle, The Three Things That Jesus Did to Secure Our Eternity. I think be thinking, preacher, three things. Well, we'll get into that in just a bit. So, but before we do that, I want to go ahead and pray, and then we will dive into God's word and see what God's word has to tell us on this subject. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for uh, coming and dying on the cross for all of our sins. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you resurrected and showed us all that you are God, and you gave us hope for our own resurrection. Lord, I pray now that as we move forward this morning, uh, that you would allow our hearts and our minds to open up and absorb everything that you have to teach us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. So the three things that I'm talking about are the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. Three separate things, all very important. That middle one tends to get forgotten sometimes, but I want to actually take some time and look at all three of these together today and see why they were each important in their own way. So first this morning, Jesus died on the cross. That is the first thing that he did to secure our eternity. Jesus was the sacrifice. He was the Passover sacrifice. He was the lamb. Now, if you've been here the past couple of weeks, this will be a bit of a uh, refresher for you. We're going to recap some of the things that we talked about the past couple of weeks. But he was the Passover lamb. Let's go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 12. And this is the passage that we've been talking about a bit. I really, really like this passage, in case you haven't noticed. Um, Exodus chapter 12, starting at verse 1, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of, the, of this month, Every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from, your, from the sheep or from the goats, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the, ho of the houses where they eat it. So the first thing I want us to notice about this passage, and we're going to compare this passage to the crucifixion. So first notice the timing of the sacrifice. This lamb was chosen on the lamb selection day. That actually corresponds with when Jesus entered into Jerusalem at the triumphal entry. It was the 10th of Nisan. So it was chosen on the lamb selection day. Then this lamb was also observed for four days and killed on the preparation day, the 14th of Nisan. Just like Jesus was killed on the 14th day of Nisan, on the preparation day for the Passover. Next, I want you to notice the condition of the sacrifice. The condition of the sacrifice. This lamb was to be without spot and blemish. Well, Jesus was without spot and blemish. You see, after four days of scrutiny, they could not find any sin in Jesus. 1 Peter 1.19 says, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. See, Peter even confirmed that this Old Testament passage was talking about Jesus. In case it wasn't obvious to the people. 
Next, Jesus was placed under the curse. So, John 19, 2 says, And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put him in a, a purple ro- put on him a purple robe. Sorry. Um, they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Now, when we were talking about Abraham a little bit while a little while back when he was going to sacrifice Isaac, the ram that was going to be sacrificed in the place of Isaac was caught in a thicket of thorns by its horns. This is just like Jesus having that crown of thorns placed on his head, jammed into his head. The thorns here are a representation of the curse. Remember we talked about that the curse was the thorns and the thickets. Uh, the, the curse wasn't work. It was going to be, work was going to be hard. You're going to have to deal with these thorns and thistles. So this crown of thorns is a symbol of that. But not only that, Jesus was placed on a cross. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So that was fulfillment of prophecies there. So in multiple ways, the curse of man was placed on on Jesus. Our, all of our sin was placed on him. Him that didn't have any sin of his own took on ours. Also remember that uh, after Jesus had been beaten, when he was finally hung on that cross, it would have been bloody. You see, the, the Bible talks about Jesus that uh, he was not only wounded, he was a wound. He was a wound. It means if you were to look at him, all you would see is one wound covering his entire body. That was a lot of blood. But that cross, those posts, just like the doorpost that that lamb's blood was on. Now remember, the one doing the sacrifice. You see... In Exodus, it says the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel will kill the lamb. Well, in Matthew 27, 25, it says, And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. His blood be on us. See, we were the reason why Jesus had to die. But God was the one doing this sacrifice. Genesis 22, 8 says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And, and the, so the two of them went together. Then Isaiah 53, 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and shall prolong, he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So God was the one that offered the sacrifice. But also, Jesus, the Son, sacrificed himself. Hebrews 1.3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So if you think about this, Jesus sacrificed himself at the command of the Father on behalf of us. But it didn't stop there. You see, remember when Jesus was on that cross, when those two thieves were next to him. And that one that repented, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, a lot of people take that to mean heaven, but that's not actually what Jesus is talking about there. Paradise was Abraham's bosom in the Old Testament. 
You see, this was a waiting place while they were waiting for the Messiah. So Jesus telling this man, you will be with me in paradise. Well, that first says that Jesus had to go to Abraham's bosom and take them to heaven. So even though Jesus said, it is finished, well, that was his work here. That was his work as the lamb, as the sacrifice. But Jesus' work after death wasn't done. You see, in the burial, Jesus continued to work on our behalf. You see, I, I was actually listening on the radio um, earlier this week, uh, actually yesterday, and it kind of upset me a little bit. You know, I, I got all excited because on the radio they said, now we have to remember the burial of Christ, that burial time, that in-between time of the crucifixion and the resurrection. And then they said, you know, we're going to go to a commercial break and come back and we'll tell you about it. So I'm waiting that commercial break to wait to hear what they have to say. And they just said that the burial was, is a time to exercise patience and, and wait for the Lord. And while patience is a really good thing, that's not what that burial time was about. See, there was a lot that actually happened during that time. Peter is the one that talks about that he went down and ministered to the saints which were imprisoned. That was that same thing, Abraham's bosom there. But that's not all Jesus did. If you would turn to Hebrews 9, and this whole passage really talks about this, but we're not going to go through the whole passage today, but I would encourage you to read it. So Jesus is our high priest. Now, his work as our high priest actually was while he was in the burial time. While his body was here, he was doing the work of the high priest. You see, not only did he have to be the sacrifice, but he had to be the one sprinkling the blood. So he sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat. And I'll explain what the mercy seat is in a minute. But it says in Hebrews 9, 12, not with the blood of goats or calves, but with his own blood, he entered into the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So Jesus went into the most holy place. Now, the, Le the, Le the Levitical priesthood had to do this all the time on earth. Uh, they would go into the tabernacle and they would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, which is the cap of the Ark of the Covenant. So it is what is holding judgment down. So they had to put the blood of whatever their offering was at least once a year on this mercy seat so that God, when God looked upon the people, he would see that blood instead of seeing their sin. So it says in uh, Hebrews 9, verse 6, and we're going to go ahead and read on to verse 10. Now when these things had, thus, had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But unto the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not, with, not without blood, which he offered for himself. Notice that this high priest there had to offer that sacrifice not only for the other people, but he had to offer that sacrifice for himself too because their high priest was himself a sinner. Ours is not. So he offered for himself and for the people's sins, committed in ignorance, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service in regard to the con conscious. Concerned only with food and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the until the time of reformation. 
So they did all this once a year. It was only concerned with their flesh, though. You see, this was only so that they could be in relationship with God for a time. And their high priest, again, was a sinner himself. It was imperfect. And it was symbolic. It was basically a copy of what was in heaven. Well, Jesus, when he was buried, he did this in heaven. It says in verse 23, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So Jesus, during that burial time, acted as our high priest, taking his own blood into the tabernacle, which is in heaven. See, I, I heard it said to me one time, you can only go as far as the blood will take you. And since the, old, the other priests before Jesus, the blood that they were sacrificing was only here, well, then that blood could not take them to heaven. But Jesus, who took his own blood, that better sacrifice, better high priest, took it into heaven and sprinkled it there. Now, after all of that, after he did all of that preparation work, he resurrected himself. The resurrection showed that he is God. So what happened on this day? What happened with the resurrection? You see, understand that this is the, the climax of all of history here. This is the most important moment, whether you were a believer or not, it changed everything. See, even if you're not a believer, you have to admit that this moment gave rise to the largest religion the world has ever seen. If you are a believer, this moment is especially important for us. So what happened? Luke 24, 1 through 12. This is actually accounted for in all four Gospels. I like Luke's... Uh, because it's what the angels actually say here. But starting at verse 1, it says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing spices which they had prepared, but found that the stone, uh, found the stone rolled away from the tomb, then they that went in did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Sorry. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, uh, I love this here, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. These angels, say, these angels are almost making fun of them here. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Can you imagine how joyful these angels were? Because not only for us was this the most important moment in history, but this was the most important moment in history for the angels as well. They were excited. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man 
must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, jo Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself what had happened. Now, I find it interesting, going back to the burial just for a moment, these followers of Christ forgot what Jesus had told them. You see, all of them were dismayed when Jesus died. They had given up. Many of them had gone back to fishing. Mary was mourning. She was bringing these spices to anoint her son for burial because they had to rush him into the tomb. They forgot what Jesus told them. But see, even though they forgot, even though they had given up, Jesus was still working on their behalf. That's what's beautiful about that whole burial situation too. And why I really say that it's not totally about patience. Because none of them were being patient. <laughs> so it was about what Jesus was doing in spite of people. He was working on our behalf, even though we had given up. But when he resurrected, he said that he would meet them in Galilee. So why is this important? Why is the resurrection so important? Well, I'll let Paul speak, on, speak for himself on this. Paul's a much better preacher than I will ever be. So Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15... Uh, 12 through 25, it says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been risen from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, if it, and we are found false witness, witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ for whom he did not raise up if, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. If, and if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have, have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life we, only we have hope in Christ, we, we, are all, uh, we are of all men the most pitiful. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, and by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one to his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are in, in Christ at his coming. Then comes the end. He delivers the kingdom to God the Father when he puts an end to the rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Notice this. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So first Paul says that this is important because if it, if it didn't happen, we're all liars. If it didn't happen, we have no hope. The next thing, the reason why he gives that it's important is because if Christ did not raise, then we will not raise. 
So Christ's resurrection is proof that we can resurrect if we believe in him. Then the last reason why Paul gives that this is important is because the last enemy that it will be destroyed is death. You see, that last reason is victory there. Jesus destroyed death. So what does this mean for us? What does this all mean for us? Well, John eleven twenty five 25 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now, without giving all of that backstory, though he may die, he shall live. That sounds like an oxymoron there. But if you understand who Jesus is, and Jesus isn't talking about living forever here, he's talking about resurrection. If we die, we, if we believe in him, we will live. Just like Jesus. Revelation 1.18, Jesus said this himself to John. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And then it says, And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So here's what this means for us. If we believe that Jesus came and died for all of our sins, that work that he did on the cross and in his burial and in his resurrection, that was all for us. And he now holds the keys. See, he defeated death. Which means if we believe in him, we get to go to heaven. We get to live forever with him. In conclusion this morning, as the pianist and song leader come, Hebrews 12, verse 2. It says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The author and finisher of our faith. The beginning and the end. But notice that second line. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising not the shame. You know what that joy is talking about there? That's you and me. We were his joy. See, when he was on the cross, he was thinking about us. He did all of this. He was the sacrifice. He was the one performing the sacrifice. He brought his blood into the holy place so that that veil on earth would be torn. You know, that was symbolic of us now having access to God. We, didn't, we no longer need a priest to do things for us. We have access to Christ, our true high priest. This is all done for us. See, other religions, they're full of dead gods. Dead, demanding gods. Gods that demand that we do all kinds of sacrifices for them and do all kinds of things for them and don't give anything back. But we believe in a living God. A God that came and died for us and resurrected and lived. That's what all of this means. That's what Resurrection Sunday means. It changed the course of human history. Whereas before man did not have access to God because of our sin, now the way is open for us to have a relationship with Christ and God and live forever.